It is a delight to see all of you. I have the pleasure to be in conversation with National Book Award winner, Pulitzer Prize winner, but everything. I mean, I can just. <laughs> Harvard University professor of law, Professor Annette Gordon, thank you so much for Glad joining. to be here. Glad to be here. So let's begin with a basic question. Why Jefferson for you? Well, that is an interesting question because I became interested in him as a kid, reading about slavery at Monticello and thinking about a person who was an enslaver, I wouldn't have used that term as a kid, slaveholder, and a person who wrote the Declaration of Independence. And he sort of embodied the American dilemma. I, even as a young person, I kind of understood that there was a disconnect mm -hmm. with those kinds of things, with that kind of uh, statement and his life. And there's so much about him that allows you an entry, entree into American life. So many things, American dilemmas, whether it's about race, slavery, politics, all religion, all those kinds of things. It's not just one, one entry point. And so it's the, the multifaceted nature of this person. He's interesting in himself, but he's also an interesting, as I said, entree into studying the country. So talk a little bit more about that. How, I mean, he is in so many ways a, represent a representative figure of the genius and tortured nature of this mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this experiment is so indebted to his brilliance mm -hmm. and shadowed by, in some ways, his, his moral corruption. Exactly. So talk a little bit more about how Jefferson is a synecdoche, mm -hmm. right? This kind of part for the whole, as mm -hmm. it were. Mm -hmm. Well, he saw himself as a figure of the Enlightenment. He saw his participation in the revolution as something new under the sun. He said there is something new under the sun, mm -hmm. the creation of the American Union. And at the same time, he saw himself, strangely enough, given where he is now, as a progressive figure. And people saw him that way. There were people who thought he was this wild-eyed radical person because he believed in the expansion of the franchise. He wrote in, you know, against slavery, even though he was a slave owner, even as a young man, there's a, an entry in his commonplace book um, when he's in his 20s, and this is before he's Thomas Jefferson or anyone, and he's talking about, he, he copies out a poem that's about a person ripped from native Africa and forced across the ocean to labor for other people. And he was gonna use it as an inscription for a graveyard for an enslaved person who died. And this is, as I said, before anybody's watching. You can't say, oh, he's doing that because he wants to curry favor with blah, blah, blah. It's just, he saw himself that way. And there are periods of time when he's in Paris, he comes up with an idea of importing Germans to Virginia and to live with enslaved people, and they would learn them sort of German uh, you know, ingenuity and so forth, and they would all become good citizens. And that's the only time he talks about black people becoming citizens. But at the same time, he's a slave owner, and Monticello is how he makes a living. Actually, not, not Monticello, maybe his outline forms. Monticello was never really profitable. But um, those two sides of him, the good side, as you said, the sort of idealistic stuff, but then there's the corruption as well from this entanglement, entanglement with slavery, which isn't just about slavery, it's about race as well. Because slavery, as you know, is racially based. Yeah. And so you can't, once it's over, the institution is over, we're still dealing with the fallout from how it taught white people what they were supposed to be about and how it tried to teach black people what we were supposed to be about. So you see in his story that whole thing, that tableau played out very, very clearly. I'm always fascinated. You know, David Walker's 1829 mm -hmm. appeal is a direct response to Jefferson's notes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in so many ways. And there, and it's a fiery polemic. Yes. Right? And in some ways, David Walker is resisting or rejecting the Enlightenment demand that you engaged in reasoned debate. Because mm -hmm. he says, how can one reasonably debate about my inferiority, yeah. as it were, right? And one of the things he's responding to is Jefferson's kind of ruminations about the biological basis mm -hmm. of black inferiority. It's one of the first moments in writing that we mm -hmm. see this account where race is tethered mm -hmm. to biology. Mm -hmm. 
this is that scientific mind, enlightenment, mm -hmm. that we're going to settle the question of black inferiority, perhaps on the medical table. Yeah, yeah. And in effect, um, uh, David Walker says, kiss my ass. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's the plant. That's, That's basically the, the pamphlet, the right? That's what he says, yes. So talk with me about, you know, the way in which he's thinking about race as a kind of transitional figure. Because mm -hmm. one of the problems, I'll say this really quickly, one of the problems is as much as I, I, I love the 1619 Project, it often assumes a kind of, a kind of constancy around the meaning of race, that mm -hmm. plantation, the way we understand race in the context of the plantation era mm -hmm. is the same way in which we understood it in the context of colonial Jamestown. That doesn't, doesn't map on right. Mm -hmm. How is Jefferson a hinge figure in the way in which we think about race in this country? Well, because he, he writes it down. And as you know, one of the things about people applying for a job, especially in academia, the things if you have a, a track record, <laughs> people can go back and look at what you wrote and say, I like it, I don't like it. Well, right. he made the mistake of putting a lot of this stuff down on paper. <laughs> it was a lot a of the stuff he was thinking about. <laughs> oh, he would be, if he were to uh, materialize and realize that those words and notes in the state of Virginia, that, that, that his reputation would hinge on that. He was afraid that the notes, what people would be upset about, were the passages in the notes about slavery, about the evils of slavery. Right. Now people see that now and say, well, he really didn't mean it, and they go straight to the racial part, which he thought, he wouldn't have thought that that was mm -hmm. a problem, that mm -hmm. that was an issue. But he is a person of the Enlightenment. He believes in science, and everything comes from, has to be looked at in this scientific way. And that's one of the problems of the, with the Enlightenment, the, the will towards categorization. Mm -hmm. It works in some things, but then when you start talking about people, yeah. categorizing people, then that's where the problem comes. And in fact, you know, David Walker is someone who challenges Jefferson on this. Uh, black people very early on began to engage with Jefferson Banneker is the first person. Mm -hmm. it, there's, a, there's a book coming out uh, by a German Jefferson scholar, Hannah Spahn, who's writing about the fact that it's been African Americans who, and their engagement with Jefferson who helped make the declaration what it actually has become. And it's because from the very beginning, people are writing to him, black people are writing to him and, and sort of trying to sound him out on all of this. Walker doesn't sound him out, he's just, he's dead. I, I really wish that he'd, He'd had two more years mm -hmm. to be alive to see what uh, Walker had to say. But that engagement from black people has been what, you know, has sort of kept the story of the declaration and the, the contradiction alive very, very much. There's this one aspect of the notes that I really found interesting when he, it's in the section on habit formation, mm -hmm. where he's talking about um, the distorting effects of the cruelty and barbarity of slavery on the character mm -hmm. of the slaveholder. Mm -hmm. And it's you know a child witnessing his father you know whip mm -hmm. a slave, mm -hmm. and what that teaches them. what that teaches them, and that that famous phrase you know that famous formulation about you know the worry about cosmic vengeance for the yeah. evil of, comes in that section mm -hmm. on habit formation. Mm -hmm. It seems that when it came to the issue, the moral question of slavery, mm -hmm. Jefferson was more concerned about its effects on white people mm -hmm. than he was about black folk. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Well, I, th I, th I think it was both, but it's clearly white people, and that's the thing that frightened him, because people would see him, Virginians would see him as being critical of them, that this was not just about black people, it was about your moral characters being warped, mm -hmm. and that's what he was afraid of, mm -hmm. you know, that he, them seeing him, why he didn't, originally didn't intend to publish it, or just publish it in limited ways, but you're right, yeah, the focusing in on what it does to us instead of what it's doing to, yeah. to African American people. And that's going to get echoed in the Tocqueville's yeah. Democracy in America. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, in the Declaration, the part that's excised when he talks about Africans as men, a distant people who never offended anybody, and here you are bringing them over again back to the slave trade thing. That was that was seen as a particularly that was a, an abolitionist, a proto-abolitionist understanding. Even though we know that that the end of the slave trade wasn't going to end slavery, but people at the time thought it was. So there are glimpses of times when he recognizes the humanity of black people, but it comes at the but it doesn't. It's not enough to make a systematic change or to argue for, or to, in his own personal life, because he argued for, 
I mean, he had an emancipation plan, and it went nowhere because Virginians were never going to vote slavery mm -hmm. out. That would have been, I mean, it took what happened, slavery ended the way it, almost, it had to happen. I mean, historians don't like to talk about inevitability, but it's hard to see how we could have voted right. that one out. Folk were just too greedy. It took, yeah, too much is property. People don't give up. African-American people were constructed as property unless you pay them. Mm -hmm. That's what the Brits did. Mm -hmm. They turned you know, wealth into actual money, and many of the families now that are wealthy, it's because they got concrete you know, money from that, that transaction. And we could think about the moral side of both of those. Is it 700,000 dead, or it's you know, a trillion you know, dollars now in, in, in today's terms mm -hmm. uh, to pay? So um, he just did, he didn't have an answer for this. You know, he's so complex, and whenever we think about race, Hovering in the shadows, under the cover of night. I know where you're going with this. Sex, sex, mm -hmm. desire. Mm -hmm. So whatever he's thinking about these black folk, mm -hmm. <laughs> whatever he's thinking about their humanity, mm -hmm. uh, what we see the relationship between race and sex and desire mm -hmm. and power. That's got to be added. Uh, in, in his relation, I don't even want to call it a relationship mm -hmm. with Sally Hemings. Mm -hmm. in, in the Sally Hemings story, mm -hmm. you have explored this. Talk a little bit, because we're talking about his contradictions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Jefferson embodies us, mm -hmm. right? He's not unique. We are his inheritance. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about this, this convergence of race, sex, mm -hmm. desire, power. Well, you know, the more I've thought about this a lot, obviously. Um, and yeah, yeah. Um, and I keep coming back. It sort of looms large for me now that this is his wife's, his late, late wife's half-sister. Hmm. You know, Sally Hemings and Jefferson's wife had the same father, John Wales. And Jefferson loved his wife. She died at 34. Um, and for complications from childbirth, essentially. And I think given how he treats Sally Hemings and her siblings, the other five who are the children of John Wales and Elizabeth Hemings, that connection meant something to him. It, it, it shapes the way he viewed her brothers and it shaped the way he viewed her and her sisters. They are sort of, they are black. They're people of African descent, mostly white, but they are also, it bumps up against, Virginians are, are, were very, very keen on family, but also race. And so there's, these two things run together here, the connection of blood and race. And they clearly were seen as a group of people apart from mm -hmm. other, not just other black people, but even other bl people at Monticello, they are different. The guys, the brothers, her brothers, some t half the time he doesn't know where they are. They're sort of out working for themselves and keeping the money, which they were not supposed to do. That was against the law, but he let them do that. The women are constructed like, more like women. They, they sew, they cook, the kind of things that women do. They don't go to the fields. They don't do that kind of thing. And so the race, they're all, Louis Armstrong said that there, <laughs> there are, there's one black person that white people just adore. <laughs> for whatever reason, there's always one. But for them, I think it was, for him, it was that family, that group of people who were connected to his wife. And I think he treated them based upon her understanding of her connection to them. I mean, as you well know, I mean, this kind of stuff was common throughout mm -hmm. slavery. And many times the women, the white women in those families would disdain mm -hmm. the children. They sell them get them out of sight. Martha brings them to Monticello with her and sort of installs them in their household. And, you know, Sally Hemings' mother, Elizabeth, probably, I mean, Martha's mother died when she was like two weeks old. And then she had two stepmothers, which she apparently didn't get along with, and they died by the time she was still a young girl. And it's Elizabeth who is the sort of constant in her life. Mm -hmm. And she seems to have 
taken that very much to heart. And so Jefferson is sort of following her lead on all of this. Um, so he sees that, I'm saying that race is important to him, but these people are an exception to the rule in a way. And still owned. Oh, absolutely. Oh, still owned, but just an exception. But they're the only ones, only people who are connected to that family leave Monticello as free people. There are no other, I mean, there are other people that are, you know, important in the plantation, the life of that plantation, but they're the only ones who have a shot at freedom. So this, we see in the story of Sally Hemings the generational. A generational aspect of this. Right, because she is the result of she, another slave yeah, bastard yeah, doing yeah, something yeah. of the same yeah, sort. And I was just, as you were, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, just as, and a person who, up until I did the Hemings as a Monticello, was, to, was said to have been, um, uh, trained as a lawyer mm -hmm. in England when in fact he was a servant. Mm -hmm. He was brought over as a servant boy. And because he was talented, he was given a, a man took him as a, you know, as a protege and he became a lawyer and a slave trader himself. Mm -hmm. And so here's this guy who's not very far from, I mean, he's, he's not owned, but he served people the same way that his sons with Elizabeth Hemings and daughters with Elizabeth Hemings served people. So. It's a very complicated, mixed up story. I'm thinking about that moment in Toni Morrison's Beloved of the Paul D's, mm -hmm. right? And how Mr. Garner, right, allowed his men to be men. Mm -hmm. And the moment in which Mr. Garner passes, the Paul, you know, the Pauls realize, and of course, Sixo, mm -hmm. realize that their manhood was in fact an extension of the master's will. Exactly. Right, exactly. this Because he could call them, Jefferson, he could call them back. Now he does end up freeing Robert and James in the 1790s. Those are the first people that he, that he frees formally. But, you know, up until that time, you know, he would write to people and say, you know, do you know where Robert is? Do you know where James <laughs> is? Uh, tell him to meet me back at Monticello at this time. And they would have to come back. Mm -hmm. So that he, it's definitely an extension of his will. So what's the legacy? What's, what, when we think about the modern legacy of Jefferson? Ah. It's What's tough. the legacy of that? It's tough uh, because you know, he's, he's always been a controversial figure. He's not like Washington who had, well, there were some. Well, his teeth were somebody else's. <laughs> the teeth were somebody else's. But Washington, I mean, Jefferson, there were always people who hated Jefferson. So he's always had a reputation that goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And now he's down. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. um, as a, you know, a person that people a figure that you sort of admire unreservedly. And now even people who, people who come to Monticello, come to Monticello to find out about him, but also now to find out about slavery, the people enslaved. And Sally Hemings and her family and her children are linked to him in a way that makes the story much more complicated than it's ever been. So it's hard to think about him now without thinking about race, without thinking about slavery, and without thinking about gender and family and power and all of those things. So it's a, you know, it's a much more complicated legacy than even I knew when I first started. I thought about it just in terms of declaration slavery right. as a kid and thinking about the strangeness of that. And now it's just so much, it's more, it's been opened up in ways. And I think there are people who In are, part because of your work. Well, I like to think so. Yeah. Um, so but um, yeah, it's opened it up a way for ways for people who are, not just interested in politics, not just interested in you know, the, the, eight, the 1790s and Hamilton and Jefferson. So he, to me, the legacy is this country was born in very, very, you know, in tragedy and triumph. Mm. And you can't, you can't get away from that. Mm. You know, you, you, it's, like, um, it's like going through a yearbook and Xing out all the people that you don't like, or who didn't like you, you got in trouble with. You're not gonna change your origins by forgetting certain things. So he is someone I think that we have to talk about, but talk about in a, the legacy is that talk about him in an open way. We're not gonna get anywhere unless we take all the story. Right. So the aspect of it. So I'm gonna bracket the end triumph part. Okay. We'll get that, we'll get there in a sec. But I have to ask this question. I gotta ask this question. I've been meaning to ask you this question for a long okay, time. Okay, this is gonna be good. When you were working on this book, on these books, when you were exploring Jefferson and all of his contradictions. Did you ever say, this son of a Oh, absolutely. This son of a 
Oh, absolutely, of course. Okay. Oh, of course now, you do. Tell me the, those, give me a sense of the moments when you're in the archive and you're working <laughs> your way. Because you know, John Jefferson comes to us in a specific sort of way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, you coming at it by way of the contradiction. Mm -hmm. But there's something that you, and you just say, I be damned. Yeah, well, uh, I'm trying to I have to sort some of them out. <laughs> um, When he's talking about, uh, Mary Hemings was Sally Hemings' sister. Mm -hmm. And when Jefferson is in Paris, he, uh, she is leased to a man named Thomas Bell. Now, there are reason to believe that she and Thomas Bell had a connection even before this happened by looking at the ages of their children. They actually had children together. And so eventually when Jefferson come back from Paris, um, comes back from Paris, she asks him to be sold to Thomas Bell. And he agrees, and he sells her and her two younger children, but he says not her two older children. And her two older children are 12 and 15, mm -hmm. Joe Fawcett and uh, you know, Betsy uh, Hemings. And you know, I know the two younger children belong, I mean, biologically belonged to Thomas Bell, but, and I also know that where they were sold is Charlottesville, and Monticello is about two miles from Charlottesville, and they're always back and forth in those places, but it made me think about my kids at the time, because my kids were teenagers, and I know how they would feel if they were separated, even though it's just down the road. I mean, you're not living there anymore, you're not with them anymore, and I thought, you know, go ahead, if he wants to buy all of them, you know, buy them all. What's the, what's the problem? Why separate? But by the time people are 12 or 14, they're considered to be grown Adults. At, at that time period. And, and you just think, you know, man, this is, this is lame. <laughs> you know, this is, this is not lame. It's not even the word. This is a terrible thing. And I remember I sitting in my office crying. Mm -hmm. You know, that happens sometimes. You know, people ask me, how do you write about slavery? How do you yeah. write about that time period? And you do it by toughening yourself in some ways that may not be good mm -hmm. because you can see that you, I'll say things to other people and they'll just be indignant. And for me, I'm like, I'm like, oh, well, you know, that's what happened. But there are just moments when you think about that and you think about those, those kids and how they were considered to be grown and you think about my kids, and I understood how they were about me. You know, when you come home, and if I'm not there, they're indignant. <laughs> you know, what do you mean she's gone to the bank? You know, it's like <laughs> that, that kind of thing. Right. Um, you just break down. Yeah. There's this Baldwin's, provo James Baldwin's provocative description of, of the evil of slavery, the barbarity of slavery, mm -hmm. is that you had to know that at some point, the slave master knew that he was selling his child. Mm -hmm. He's trying to get at the intimacy of the cruelty. Mm -hmm. And this is another example of mm -hmm. this, right? That yeah. For greed's sake, for mm -hmm. money's sake, mm -hmm. right? In some yeah, way. just keeping them there. Well, they don't, it's like they don't have the same kind of connection to their parents that, you know, if somebody said, I'm going to separate you from Patsy and Polly, his daughters, you no, know, he would say that's ridiculous. Ridic it's absurd. Mm -hmm. So I, I said I was going to bracket the tragedy and triumph thing. And, and the reason why. I wanted to bracket it, is that often, we, by putting the two together, we lose sight of the nature of the dramatic term tragedy. Mm -hmm. Like the triumphant story is the story of America's inevitable progress, mm -hmm. right? But when we think about tragedy as a kind of dramatic term, there's always, right, uh, the lesson learned, mm -hmm. right? There is the kind of release, the epiphonic moment that mm -hmm. tragedy enables. Yeah. So what, what does it do for us to think about our beginnings as triumphant, when in fact, the lesson isn't in the triumph. The lesson is actually, mm -hmm. well, this may be the case. This is, mm -hmm. may be a reading. The lesson is actually found in the tragedy. Mm -hmm. well, well, hubris, it makes you uh, conceited that you don't really understand how hard won this what is. all this is, whatever progress that we've made, it hasn't been easy. And you think that, using the word inevitable, that we're actually always going to progress and go forward, and that's not exactly true. Right. 
You know, I mean, in ways in the past few years that it's become really apparent yeah. to us that there's no inevitable bright future. And thinking only about the triumph uh, makes you, sort of blinds you to that. And you don't mm -hmm. think about how easily all of it could be lost mm -hmm. and how important it is to be vigilant about these kinds of things and to understand, and you can see it in the, the flaws and the weaknesses of, at the beginning. You know, mm -hmm. thinking about a question of race, thinking about family, who are the people? And who are the people that we the people, does it include black people? You know, and how does it include black people? Does it, you know, it's, it's something, it's a question that we still seem to be asking ourselves uh, right now. And you, you don't wanna, there was an article in The Atlantic, I think, about the sort of fatalistic view of history Mm, that everything yeah. is George all Packer. bad. Yeah, George, George Packer, Packer, everything mm -hmm. is all bad. And I kind of understand what he's saying, but you don't have to be fatalistic. And one doesn't, isn't fatalistic if you are realistic about the things that happen and you're not hiding them. And I think it's a way forward for us. Yeah, I, it's, I, it's humbling for us to think about, they didn't have all the answers. There's a tendency too to think, oh, they, they had the better answer. We don't have smart enough people. We don't have enough, we don't have the, the capacity when we actually do. Yeah. I read that George Packer piece in The Atlantic as a lamentation for the loss of consensus history, mm -hmm. uh, a longing for it in the face of the contradictions we've, we, we now confront. I have to ask you this. You, you've opened it up. You, you are a student of, of Jefferson, a student of the, our, of the law, a student of race and the law. You teach uh, uh, some of the folks who are going to be at the center of this uh, experiment for, for, for generations to come. Um, where, where are you <laughs> in terms of the current state of the country? What are you, I mean, because you, you, every time I talk with you, Annette, you're like this. <laughs> right? No matter what's going on, you're like, boom. <laughs> right? You're calm, steady, steady as it goes. Mm -hmm. But when you look out, and you see the state I of the country. I just appear to be calm. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, we're gonna make, we're gonna make that explicit. <laughs> what, what's going on inside you? What are you feeling when, and seeing and thinking when you look out on us today? Oh, it's despair. Hmm. I mean, I, I don't understand where we are. I, I don't, <laughs> it never occurred to me that there would be Americans who would say, hey, we should be like Hungary. <laughs> what? Wow. You know, or I you know, think that Putin's better than Joe Biden. I mean, you don't have to be a Democrat, but Putin? <laughs> I mean, you know, um, I don't, and, and to think of all of the money that we spent on a Cold War and said, oh, we can't afford this, we can't afford that, we've got to fight this thing, and now the same people, Putin, the same folks who were the enemies then, now, Many of the people who back in that day would have been the ones arguing for mm -hmm. spending all the money now say, oh, these are our friends. I just, I don't understand it. And, and, you, and I, I don't get it. So I feel, and studying the early American Republic right. and thinking about what people thought they were doing. Because I think in a way they were creating something new. They got rid of monarchy. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have a government that was supposed to be run by people, not granted a small amount of people, but eventually it expanded to not just property owning white men, and then eventually black men got the vote, although it was circumscribed severely for a long time. I mean, you know, there was something started, something was set out into the world, and now people seem to not value it. So what do you say to someone, let me just parrot it for a moment, um, what you're saying makes me uncomfortable. The history that you're telling um, throws me into a sense of guilt. Um, it seems as if you are uh, telling a particular story of the nation uh, that blames a particular group. Uh, it's, this is, oh, well, let me stop. This is wokeism. Mm -hmm. This, what we've just been doing it's critical race theory. As a professor of law, you, you can snicker at that. But how do you respond to the battle being waged over the story we tell ourselves in the midst of all the other things you've just described? Well, I, I don't, I'm not making anything up. 
You know, I mean, you know, if I were, if in fact there were no slavery, if there had no, been no race, racially based slavery, if, the, if I were telling a story, then, I, then that would be a problem, but I'm not making it up. And the task is to say, we've learned. Hmm. We've learned something from that. You know, we can look at Jefferson and talk about race and all of those things, but we, whatever enlightenment we have, Americans in generally have, a lot of it comes, well, black people always understood they were human beings, but to the extent that other people have changed, it's because of the things that we've learned. I mean, a lot has happened since 1826 when Jefferson died. There was Frederick Douglass, there was W.E.B. Du Bois, there was the Holocaust, there were all of these things that we've learned a lot from, okay? But that, and so we can look at this and say, you know, we can see them as benighted people. They were who they were at that time. We have a different task. It doesn't mean that we are we're not the same as they were. We can go forward. But there's no way to talk about history without telling the things that actually happened. And what I think a lot of it is is that people don't, there seems to be a, a vested interest in denying that bad things happen to black people. And it's that people don't want their children to know that, to know how their great-grandparents and their great-great-grandparents carried on because some of them did carry on in a very bad way. Well, the answer is to say, I don't want to be that way. There are plenty of things that people in the past did, mm -hmm. that our ancestors did, that I would say, I'm not going to do that anymore. The uh, relations between men and women, all kinds of things have changed. And so I, I would say to people, be better. Hmm. You know, you can. That's the whole purpose of a notion of progress, is that we did this before, that was wrong, now we're moving on to something else. I don't know how to help them if they think that you're supposed to have a history that's just all, you know, peaches and cream and just Indeed. great stories. It's just, a, that's not it. Yeah. We want to open it up for questions. We have microphones here on each side. We want you to be succinct and have a question. <laughs> have a question. <laughs> so we'll start, we'll start here. So in Notes of State of Virginia, Jefferson says, indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever, that considering numbers and so forth, you know that. Yeah, yeah. So is this Jefferson's fear? Is this his morality out of the blue just coming to pass? Or what, what is he saying here? Well, he's saying slavery is wrong. And we've created black, we've created a situation where black people would justly kill us if they had the opportunity. I mean, what happens with the American Revolution, and he says this in a letter in 1813, that you know, before the revolution, white people thought of black people just, just as property. You know, they're like horses and cattle. But once the revolution came and the war comes and black men join the army, and the uh, Patriot Army and also the Loyalist Army, he and other people began to see black men as potential soldiers. And the fear is not black women, the fear is black men. They will rise up against us and they would be right to rise up against us because if people were doing this to me, I would rise up against them. So it's, it's fear. It's really, you know, he thought that slavery, and this is a Lockean formulation, but he thought slavery was a state of war. Black people and white people were at war with one another. And it was none of this gone with the wind, you know, these are my family, and although some of them are his family, but, um, you know, this family, the Roman notion of family, it was these people have a, have a cause. And if they have, get the opportunity, they will, they will fight us. So he felt that that, was, that would be the judgment of God? Yes, that would be the judgment of God, because the Almighty has no aspect that could take our side in the struggle. Thank you. And Haiti scared the sh no. Oh, yeah, that, it did, yeah. <laughs> that, that was a good lead-in to my question, which was uh, it, touching on the modern impact of Jefferson. The uh, vocal atheist today, Richard Dawkins, uh, Christopher Hitchin, rest in peace, Sam ha Harris, claim Jefferson is one of their own. Do you mm -hmm. agree? Uh, and I had a lot of conversations with Christopher about this. No, I don't think he was an atheist. Right. I think he believed that there was something that created the universe, but I don't think he sat, he thought that you could pray to it. I mean, even though he did 
you know, I offer prayers for this and that and the other. I don't, he didn't think that God, that there was a God who intervened in the daily lives of people. But he, you know, he believed that there was something that made the world. He didn't believe that Jesus was divine. He thought he was just a good guy. Uh, you remember, he, you know, he wrote, he basically wrote his own Bible or made his own Bible, cutting out all the miracles and so forth. Um, so, but that didn't make him an atheist. And I think Christopher thought that he was an atheist, and I don't, I don't think that's right. Thank you. Often historians worry that their work is just going to be preaching to a very small choir of other scholars who are pretty much ready to you know, accept or think about the ideas that they're putting forward in their work. But in my mind, your work on the Stalin Hamming story has permeated the culture in a much wider way, and people have been popularly more willing to think about it and think about Jefferson more critically. When you were writing, did you think that, yes, Sally Hemings is going to be the story that's going to start to open up American minds? Or did you see yourself as writing to a smaller audience of scholars? I didn't, I didn't see myself as writing to a small audience of, of scholars. Um, I didn't know what, my first book, I didn't know what the response would be. I just knew I had to write it. Hmm. You know how it is when there's something that you, I, did, I didn't have a publisher. I'd never written a book, and I was supposed to be writing a law review article, and I, and I wrote a book. I didn't tell anybody I was writing a book except my husband. I really just felt compelled to write this, so I don't think I thought very much about anything beyond <laughs> writing the book. I figured somebody would publish it, and it was just mania, essentially, um, <laughs> uh, that was driving this along. Um, the thing about Sally Hemings is that Sally Hemings has been written about before me. Fawn Brody mm. wrote a very popular biography of Jefferson that has never been out of print, that treats the story as true. Barbara Chase Rabu did a novel, Sally Hemings, that became an international bestseller. So I think it was mainly historians who had a problem with the Sally Hemings story. I don't think most Americans didn't think that that was a crazy idea because they knew, you know, what slavery was like, and it could have happened. Um, but I, I would say for the first book, I just wanted to write the book. The Hemings is a Monticello I was hoping would reach a larger audience and that it would not just be Sally Hemings because the idea was to, at first I said I'm not gonna write about her uh, and I'm, not, I'm just gonna not pay that much attention to her. And I realized, no, she's the linchpin of all of this right. and so she has to be there. But I really wanted people to think about James Hemings and Robert and her mother and all. that's why it's the Hemings is a Monticello. That goal was to, to write about um, enslaved people in a way as a saga and give people a stake in people in the Hemings family other than Sally Hemings. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, it, in hearing the kind of history of Thomas Jefferson, it seems like there's a certain economic incompetence that's sort of core to his inability to live out the values that he, he writes about at times. You know, knowing that their society was kind of less preoccupied with the economy, I think, than maybe our own, how aware was he of that? How much was that kind of an internal struggle for him that he wasn't able to kind of envision a way of supporting himself outside of slavery? Well. I don't, think he, I don't think he thought seriously about it. Um, he didn't think seriously about, he called himself a farmer and he pretended to be interested in it, but he really was, he was really a writer and a builder. He spent more time, more money. I mean, Monticello has more people working on buildings and then things than it does agriculture. Um, and Madison Hemings, his son, said he had but little taste for ag agriculture. He, it was mainly his builders, his workmen that he wanted to be with, and that was carpenters and so forth, because he was a woodworker himself. You know, it, Monticello was seem, seems like sort of a backdrop where he could be there writing. And if you think about his life, that's pretty much what he did. He wasn't a businessman. When his grandson took over um, the plantation, Productivity increased incredibly. Um, he also whipped people, but he, you know he was a different type of person. Um, so he wasn't wasn't competent um, as as a farmer, as a as a business person, and it just didn't. I don't think he thought very much about how he could do anything else because he didn't have to. See, once you start doing when I, when I mentioned to you about the Hemings family, how they were apart.
even though they were apart from everybody else, I really do think his connections to them told him what kind of slave owner he was because he was, quote unquote, good to them, the people who were around him. You know, he thought that he was doing this in a good way. He went from a, being a young man saying, you know, we've got to get rid of this institution to figuring out how you could be better in it. And once you do that, it's over. You get the contradiction of a benevolent slave. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. First of all, thank you for kicking the door open on this subject mm -hmm. and letting more of a story be told. I have two questions. One, is there any paper that you found that might indicate how Sally Hemings felt about Thomas Jefferson? Mm -hmm. And two, what, do you find, what have you found lately? Well, on the first, no, there's no paper that I found that say what she thought about him. Um, the only thing, you have to look at her son's recollections about this and um, an incident that happened in the 1920s when someone f contacted Monticello and said that they had items that had been given to them by their grandmother, their great-grandmother had been handed down and they were very excited at first <laughs> until they figured out who it was from. And there were some glasses, a, pair, a couple of pair of glasses, uh, a belt, and some other trinket or something like that. And it was Sally Hemings, one of Sally Hemings' grandchildren, who said that she had kept these things and given them to her family. That's the only action, besides coming back from Paris, but she came back from Paris for, I mean, her family was here. Right. You know, that's a real dilemma that black people who are gonna run away, you know, she wanted to stay in Paris, but if you think about leaving your mother and your sisters and all those people, that's the other cruelty of slavery, that if mm. you seek freedom on your own, then that means you're leaving people behind. But there's no, other than, you know, if you take the gesture of keeping stuff of his, rather than just sort of forgetting about it, um, that's the only thing that she did towards him that we know anything about. So we don't, the grandchildren talk about how he felt about her, but they never, not that I have heard say anything about how she felt about him. It becomes hard to imagine what love looks like under, yeah, under yeah. chorus of conditions. <laughs> thank yes. you. Thank you so much, please. Hi, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Um, I think my question is just, is there something that we should take away from the way that Jefferson's um, popularity and, and status has waxed and waned in the last 200 plus years or so? Something we should take away from it is that he wrote a lot and had an enormous impact on his time. There isn't anybody who had, I mean, from the time he's elected president, the first time, 1800, mm. up, through, up through Jackson with a small, you know, intercession of, of, of John Adams, uh, John Quincy Adams, no person has had that kind of political influence for that length of time, mm -hmm. dominated. And so you make a lot of enemies when you dominate. You make a lot of friends and a lot of enemies. So I think it's, it shows you how large he loomed in that time period that he started out even in death, even though people were very taken with the idea that he and Adams died on the 50th anniversary of the you know, signing of the Declaration of Independence, um, he quickly becomes a figure that people argue about. And I think that's one of the more interesting kind of people, not so about somebody that there's, a consensus, that there's a consensus on and you just move forward. He's, it's taken Lincoln a long time, I guess maybe in the South, he was a controversial figure. But, um, <laughs> you know, Jefferson, as I said, there were always people who loved him and hated him. And so I think, th I think the thing you should take from that is that this is a person who had an enormous effect upon the country and had people responding to him accordingly. We have only two minutes, so we're going to get both of these questions in. And I'll be succinct. Really quickly. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So really quickly. Uh, thank you. So um, thank you for your time. I have a question. James Baldwin once said that people are trapped in history and history is trapped in them. Mm -hmm. With that being said, can you dive into the hypocrisy of Thomas Jefferson that we are trapped in today and touch on a way to escape it? Mm -hmm. uh, my quick question <laughs> is uh, we, uh, 
when I look at this period right now, you were saying you're not quite sure what's going on. Mm -hmm. I see slavery reconstruction and post reconstruction, and then I see segregation, civil rights, and I believe post civil rights is what we're going through right now. How would you see it? Mm -hmm. Both of those questions are okay, related. Okay, well, really quickly. Um, you know, as to hypocrisy, what we can do about it is recognize it. I mean, I think a lot of it, a lot of the problem comes when people think, are sort of thinking only about their motivations and casting them only in the good side and can't see the weak. I think that was his issue. He was convinced, as I guess most of us are, that he was a good person. And, you know, he does say at some point what an incomprehensible machine man is, you know, that you want you know, you can want things for yourself that you don't give to other people, but you really need to take that to heart and to understand that human beings doing unto others as you would have them do unto you, it's a relatively simple rule, but it's the hardest thing to do, but it has to be done. Mm -hmm. You know, people have to take that seriously. You know, of course, we are trapped in the same kind of, or we, we haven't gotten out of, I think the sort of post-reconstruction mm -hmm. era and the backlash against efforts to bring black people into full citizenship because as I alluded to before, there's been a question since the very beginning, are we a part of the people really? Are we a part of it? And there are many Americans apparently who don't think that we are. And the battle for this, the battle about this has been from the very, very beginning. Can we give Professor Annette Gordon-Reed a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very good. Thank you very much.